century superhuman And I know that the answers are inside Yeah, I am a 21st century superhuman Now, now, now is the time Come, come Come on, everyone, let's celebrate We are the children of the sun I can see you when I look into your eyes We are the same, and we are light, and we are one Hear now, hear my ancient prayer and sing along We are awakening as one we can make a difference, yeah, we can be the change it takes to make the world a lot more fun. Well, if you're feeling kind of down and you need some inspiration to remember who you are, oh, now, child, please don't frown. You can choose a new vibration and these words can take you far. First century superhuman And I know that the answers are inside Hi there, I'm Carrie Ellis, author of the 21st Century Superhuman book series and today I have with me as a special guest, Peter Moon. Peter, be sure to unmute yourself and hop on with me and... Um, Peter Moon has an upcoming book. He has actually multitudes of books out at skybooksusa.com. Um, an amazing historian, time travel, futuristic um, technology person, very aware of a lot of things going on under the surface. Peter, you write a lot of your books as um, fiction, right? Um, a lot of the... No, no, you know? no, that's not correct. I okay. do not write a lot of my fiction. I've written one uh, that is pure fiction. Okay. And and another that is deliberately part fiction and part true. Uh, but the majority of them are not fiction at all. Okay. Well, um, my my mistake then. Um, but what you have okay. what you have coming up now is definitely a historical um, book that you're co you've co written with. Um, Douglas Dietrich, correct? That's correct. It's it's not it's a, it's it. The book is out. It, the book it, is out. Okay. And, and, yes, and and uh, it, yes, it's a very exciting book called "The Roswell Deception and the Demystification of World War II," mm. uh, written in collaboration with Douglas Dietrich. And Douglas Dietrich was a Defense Department research librarian, where his job was to collate and or destroy government documents that were uh not to be viewed or seen wow and he read the history of the defense department uh in the presidio uh, at this is more of the western uh part of the defense department which is the presidio is the largest was the largest military base uh in the western united states the largest being the pentagon it was second only to the pentagon known as the pentagon of the west coast it is where the United Nation, United Nations was formed as an organization of war to fight against the Allies. It had an earlier history going back to the Spanish-American War, where which San Francisco was the uh, oldest fortress in the West Coast uh, going back to the Spanish years. The Spanish actually had an earlier fortress in Monterrey, which is the Presidio at Monterrey, but the premier one was in San Francisco and it was the Spanish fortress and then evolved into a American military fortress uh, when United States, uh, you know, invaded Mexico and took, took California for their own. So the, uh, this is the history he read. Uh, and now he was assigned to burn documents. Right. And, this, uh, he was not of the class uh, pay grade to do this. In other words, his classification was not that high to be burning, the, burning these sensitive documents. 
but nevertheless, they ordered him to, and he did it under protest. But instead of just burning the documents, he would read them. That's incredible. And I, I mean, I've been on with you and him. He's absolutely brilliant. And he, I'm sure he has a mind like a library. I mean, it seems like there's so much knowledge that he has cataloged. He is a human library. Yes. He is a human library. And we have mm. not, he is actually the inspiration for the character Data in Star Trek, The Next oh, Generation. Oh, he is like that. I'm mean, not, I have like yes. chills. Yes. Yes. Well, the, the reason for that is very involved. However, uh, Gene Roddenberry used to go up to the Presidio to get information. Uh, you know, he uh, he was a former uh, pilot and a former uh, worked for the LAPD. Oh my gosh! And that's kind of how he ingratiated himself into Hollywood through the LAPD, a public relations officer for the LAPD. But he, uh, if you see Star Trek uh, the movie. And other aspects, they always show San Francisco to be the headquarters of Starfleet. San Francisco, you'll see the gold. Interesting. Like, like, see now, bridge in the background. I've watched tons of Star Trek, and I just never, it's one of those like subconscious things that never really entered my conscious mind. But that is so interesting. Yes, it comes into play in the 1980s with the movie uh, Star Trek IV, uh, mm. when they, go, they actually go to San Francisco. They go to San Francisco back in time, and and they go to this this aquarium. Uh, yes, and they get involved right. The yeah, yeah, right. You see, they go I to San Francisco, that. and that's and that's later to be the headquarters of Starfleet, and then it gets uh, worked some more in the series, the Star Trek: The Next Generation, or the series Star Trek: The Next Generation. And Douglas Dietrich was known as Data by his. Um, I guess what you would call his, the person he served. He was to collect information uh, in wow. part of his duties. Like, I mean, he was a reference librarian for Colonel Michael Aquino. And Colonel Michael Aquino was a uh, died in the wool Satanist. He was the chaplain. Uh, he wrote the chaplain's handbook for the U.S. Army. Uh, and he was a Satanist. And it was, a, you know, s s the satanic chaplain had rule over the U.S. Army over all the other chaplains. So uh, this is the background of where we're coming from and the illicit uh, behavior of what went on at the Presidio. Right. Now, this, this book is not about the Presidio, but this is the background. Man, now, that is other, amazing. That really takes it up to a whole nother level. And this is what it, it I is love amazing. about you and how you write because you always have these multi layers in there and of what you're exposing and what you're transmitting. And I think it's well, it, interesting. I did write uh, really by one book that's one pure fiction is called Spandau Mystery. Right. Uh, and it's it, Spandau Mystery is a book that I wrote uh, to get at threads that I could not find out through normal investigation. And it's about uh, the Moors. It's about General Patton. It's about Nazi flying craft, Rudolf Hess. That's why it's called Spandau Mystery. Yes. And the financial uh, ties of Rudolf Hess. And although it is not mentioned in the book, when I've never had time to write a sequel, I've had other priorities. But when I get to the end of the book, the two main characters have just discovered the Montauk Project and, and are now you know, it's, it's a happy ending, but now they're going to take a trip. They're going to take a trip to San Francisco just to get away from it all. And I, I picked San Francisco because it's not only an, an area which I lived and came from, but it, it was, uh, they were going to encounter the Presidio scandal surrounding Michael Aquino. I was going wow. to have them hitting that. Now, my uh, fiction or art imitates truth right and vice versa but see here it was uh i wrote that book many years ago and it would be five or six years before i would encounter douglas Dietrich. and let me just bring and, up that i i don't want to interrupt you but you and i did a show on that book the spandau mystery a couple of years ago i think and i will put the link to that show under this video because it was really excellent. interesting. yes excellent so, yes um 
I'd then, forgotten. Uh, I, I started rereading some of it because I kind of forgot it. And it's, it's really a great process as an author to find out where the book is going, because it, it not only ties into uh, the San Francisco connection, or that was the, the next book, it ties into uh, some of the Southeast and, and Asian connections that Douglas uh, not only has offered me, but also goes beyond some of the things he has offered me. So we're going very deep into Asia uh, in this story that we're going to be talking today. Now, to disambiguate and to clarify, um, the Roswell documents that we're going to be talking about today are not documents that he was assigned to burn. He was assigned to collate them for the base commandant. He does not know why he was assigned to, or why he wanted them, but he assigned all the stuff on Roswell. And there were big boxes like trunks that, you know, said crypto top secret, you know, it was, wow. and he had to uncover these and collate the documents and read them so that he knew what he was putting together so he could give the commandant a assessment of what had transpired wow. uh, to create the Roswell incident. And now I'm just going to ask you, um, you've heard a little bit about this book, both from him and me, but I just want to ask you, if I ask you, uh, Carrie, of a month ago, if, if I asked you about Roswell or one of your, uh, you know, people who listen to your broadcast, right. say, you know, at dinner says, Carrie, what do you think about the Roswell incident? What would you have said? I know that's a great question. And as a result of talking to you, I've kind of changed my view here, but I would say the whole Roswell story of the crash and the aliens and the alien talking to the nurse and all this stuff telepathically is kind of one of my pet, you know, I believe in alien stories. And, um, and I'd say, yeah, like I've sort of thought of it as some of that alternative history that maybe was important. And now that I've talked to you, I'm like saying, maybe this is a piece of history that needs to be rewritten. Maybe we were told a story that wasn't true. And we're in this time of disclosure. I mean, disclosure is what is happening now. What stories have we been told as a narrative to make us think certain things are going on? And what is the truth behind it? Well, I'm glad you mentioned disclosure because there has been so much hubbub about disclosure for years now. And two people that I would consider friends, uh, very intelligent men, got involved in the disclosure movement. And they were being fed stuff by some intelligence agent that they really believe. And one of the intelligence agents or people in the government said disclosure is going to happen. But the, the thing holding it up is there are many dead bodies and the people responsible for those dead bodies are still alive. Once they go, it will be released. Now, I feel that that is true and we'll discuss that today. However, I don't feel that this person telling them was being sincere. And anyway, these two individuals got very betrayed and kind of got out of the disclosure uh, movement. Mm -hmm. Now, I always thought the disclosure mm -hmm. movement was a bunch of uh, BS. Right. Because of the person who was spearheading it, uh, Dr. Uh, Stephen Greer, he has all sorts of problems. Well, I, I'm going to just say there's disclosure in a lot of areas. So, you know, the UFO topic and the uh, is one area. There's disclosure in a lot of other areas as well on what have we been told as a narrative and what is really true. But what, what has been heavily promoted as the disclosure is the disclosure of UFOs. And this was heavily promoted uh, on Fox News by Tucker Carlson. And as soon as our book came out, it undermined everything because nobody wants disclosure anymore. They they just played it down. Uh, yeah, they so yeah, there was all these. Thing. Oh yeah, because it's not like people don't know about Douglas Dietrich and Peter Moon and their collaboration. It's not like they don't know. Doug Douglas's uh, telephone internet has been heavily monitored. The, the poll outside. There's all sorts of stories about this. Um, so. It's and like I'll just say, I was on with you two guys the other night, and he has regular lives on YouTube that people can join him on. And he's on other 
I think he's on other channels as well, but he's really well, he's on YouTube every Wednesday and Sunday nights. And I come on at nine o'clock with him and we're going to be going into his personal history. Why don't uh, I and, put and a pay. link to his YouTube channel under this video as well? Because he's a very interesting person to listen to. It's, a, it's an excellent idea. And I thank you for that. Yes. Um, and his birthday's coming on October 20th, and I'm encouraging everybody to contribute to him nice. for his birthday. But uh, so anyway, because he deserves it, uh, the information he's giving us. But but anyway, uh, so th this disclosure is, this is a huge, this book, The Roswell Deception and the Demystification of World War II, is the most pivotal book on disclosure that we've ever had. Wow. And I'm not saying that because I contributed to it and published it, but because it is true. If it wasn't, I wouldn't be doing it. I have never been interested in the UFO movement. They've never puzzled me too much. Uh, of course, there, there is always an element of not know. Uh, but uh, I, uh, the, the most interesting thing I would have said about the Roswell incident, well, there was a radio broadcast announcing that the army had recovered flying saucers. That I thought was significant that it went out on the press and then it was withdrawn. Mm -hmm. Well, there is a reason that it was withdrawn. That was a, uh, a psyop to make everybody think it was a flying saucer, an alien crash. And then they withdrew it saying, no, it was a weather balloon, which was to make people think they were hiding it was an alien crash. It was very clever and it's worked. Smart. And, yeah. 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 Very clever. And, and it, and it worked uh, in, incredibly well. And, and people are uh, hypnotized by this idea. There's even a TV show based upon it called, there's been two TV shows. Uh, I asked my daughter about what she thought about. She says, Oh, that's, that's old. That's old. She didn't know it was a new show too, but she has no interest in it. Young people, aren't necessarily uh, too fascinated with Roswell. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, it's something that our generation heard about for years. So but there was I'm a going... big hole in the ground, right? In the pictures they showed, there was like a, some kind of a explosion or... Well, there, there, in, indeed, there was an explosion. But to what, what this was at Roswell, it's, it's a involved story. But it begins with the demystification of World War II. And this Roswell, and this book clearly explains it. It starts out with an opening statement. An opening statement in this book, uh, much like as if you were trying to, to uh, present a case in court. And I'm going to just review that opening statement. because be great. Uh, basically... It's to deconstruct two major myths that were laid on the American public by the Office of War Information. Now, most people don't even know what the Office of War Information is. Of course, it was later umbrellaed into the CIA or whatever, I, I specifically, but it was originally created at the onset of World War I uh, with the Office of Censorship to stifle all information coming in about the war. And this it would answer directly to President Roosevelt. But the myths we're gonna, we do deconstruct in this book. Number one is that the empire of Japan was an aggressor nation who attacked Pearl Harbor without provocation nor just cause. And I'm mentioning Japan here because Japan, it was a Japanese craft, craft craft that crashed at Roswell. Okay, the empire of Japan was an aggressor nation who attacked Pearl Harbor without provocation and just cause. And further, as a direct result of atomic bombs being dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Imperial Japan surrendered unconditionally, it being announced by Emperor Hirohito on August 15th and formally signed on September 2nd, 1945 aboard the USS Missouri thus bringing the hostilities of World War II to a close. That is the number one myth we're going to deconstruct. Uh, and that all sounds true. Yeah, they signed, they had a ceremony board in Missouri. Uh, there were bombs dropped that made Japan surrender. They were down on their knees. 
and that Japan had attacked Pearl Harbor and they were real bad guys. Uh, the second myth is that based upon a July 47 press release from Roswell Army Airfield, Public Information Officer Walter Hutt uh, unleashed the seeds of a myth that created a story that was circulated in the Roswell Daily Record that personnel from the 509th Operations Group had recovered a flying disc which had crashed on a ranch near Roswell. Um, this included a report that Major Jesse Marcel had recovered a flying disc from the rangelands of an unidentified rancher in the vicinity of Roswell and that the disc had been flown to a higher headquarters. Uh, the same story uh, also reported a Roswell couple to have seen a large identified object fly by their home on July 2nd. Um, and then this myth goes on and on and on uh, in, in, the, in the papers. Now, first I'm gonna go back and de deconstruct Pearl Harbor. Um, Pearl Harbor was the result of an extant open hostility between Japan and the United States, which goes back many years. It, it, to go into the prehistory of the conflict, now Japan was an ally of the United States in World War I. They were an ally. But there was hostility with Japan. And one of the problems, the United States had a problem with Japan. Japan was an isolationist country. It had stayed out uh, of people's business. But there was a man named Commodore Matthew Perry who brought his fleet into the into Japan, right. into the harbor, and forced them at gunpoint to uh, trade and become part of the world. Wow. And the J Japanese... Uh, shogun mindset felt very embarrassed of their own inability to defend themselves. So they put America on the watch list. Mm -hmm. And 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 what Matthew Perry, they wanted a piece of the drug trade, that uh, the opium trade that Britain had overrun China with. It was it was a scandal in Asia. So anyway, they wanted their peace. Uh, and then later, America invaded the Philippines, Spanish-American War, complete pretense. And they conquered the Philippines. And they slowly, they, they cut off the oil supply to Japan, slowly, slowly, mm. slowly, slowly. And, and so what time frame are we in right here? Matthew Perry was this, World War II, right? He was 1950s. No, Commodore Perry was 1850s. Oh, 1850s. Okay, so he was a long time ago. So and he forced Japan. That uh, was, you know, they were they were in the, you know, sort of medieval. So this is back uh, in the 1800s. They were wanting part of the drug trade. The opium. The trade. United States did, yeah. Why? Yeah, the opium trade had been going for a long time. Why? Why? Because it's that's what kept the British Empire afloat. It was power. It was money. The British Empire could not have survived without the the opium trade. The the, the uh, what do they call it? The East India Company. Right, and then we have drug trade and, running things today too. So, well, that see that was appropriated by the United States. It's called the Golden Triangle, and the Flying Tigers. This is all part of the book. The Flying Tigers that that see what this is what happened is. Um, President Roosevelt was a diabolical man, although he's positioned as the guy who gave fireside chats and right. got us out of the depression. He was the secretary, assistant secretary of the Navy in World War I. He basically ran the Navy. Uh -huh. And he invaded Haiti. The United States invaded Haiti. And primary reason they invaded Haiti was because the Germans, who were a hostile nation during World War I, uh, were going into Haiti, marrying locals so that they could acquire property. You couldn't own property in Haiti. Uh, Haiti is 
older than the United States. It's, uh, it was settled by, colonized by the French. Uh-huh. But um, so, so in, any, in any case, the United States uh, invaded Haiti because they felt the threat by the Germans. Now, Roosevelt indiscriminately killed black people even putting him on spits and stuff. It was horrible what he did. He, he was a, a horrible person. And uh, he's known as the butcher of Haiti. Wow. By the Haitians. Not, not by Americans. And this is just uh, stuff that's not brought up. But anyway, um, Roosevelt had been playing with a plan before he became president. In fact, when he ran, he ran against Warren Harding in the 1920 election. Mm -hmm. And he was the vice presidential candidate. He wasn't the presidential candidate. And one of the reasons Harding won the election is he exposed. He says, you know, although I'm a member of the KKK, Warren Harding, he says, people like me, the black people like me better than Roosevelt. They know what Roosevelt's done. So Roosevelt helped lose that election. But Roosevelt, as Secretary of the Navy, was planning to invade the take over the world. And when he became president, he had he activated this plan. Uh, and this is historical. You can look it up. War Plan Red, mm. which was a plan to invade England. War Plan Crimson was to invade Canada. He had different names, War Plan Orange or Yellow. It, I, it depends which version you read. I think Orange says Japan. Uh, invade all these countries. I mean, it wasn't just one or it wasn't just. Now, why did he want to invade England? He and Canada, he wanted the, the drug trade. This was power. Wow. He was a madman. He was a politician. Now, it's interesting that uh, right after his. Uh, well, I, I, you know, he got polio right after some of these dastardly deeds he did. Right. There, there was a, there was, it wasn't like, if you looked at it from a karmic viewpoint. Yes. Um, let, let me see. I was just thinking if I can that. See. Yeah. Um, okay. This was right after World War I. Uh, Woodrow Wilson got sick and became paralyzed for the rest of his life. Um. Not Wilson and Roosevelt both became paralyzed. Uh, Wilson lost his faculties because he had poisoned. He had won World War One with uh, biological warfare. Mm. Now, what uh, Roosevelt had the Rainbow War Plan, and the purpose of this was to, and it's even in the headlines of the Chicago Daily Tribune of December 4th, 1941, right before the Pearl Harbor attack, it says FDR's war plan. And he had war plan crimson to invade Canada. The entire purpose was to leave no Canadian alive. It was a war of genocide and the Americans would repopulate a depopulated Canada and the entire country would all be Americans. Man. Um, they appropriated the War Department in 1935 to uh, arranged for congressional appropriations of $57 million to construct three air bases on the border uh, hastily for preemptive surprise attacks on Canadian airfields. Oh, my God. And this is all historically yeah, verifiable. Amazing. <laughs> and, and But see, the reason he was so hot on Canada was that this is 1935. England was under direct threat of Germany. And England was okay. running Canada. Well, yes, but you see, the royal family knew that they were vulnerable mm. if Germany invaded. Now, uh, if if Hitler eased off on, on the, the what was called Dunkirk, the escape when all the right. Allied soldiers from Britain escaped from Dunkirk, uh, Hitler let them go. He he wanted. He thought England would be his ally. If he had 
not, not let these soldiers go back to England. He could have taken England. He didn't take England when he had the chance. And they were able to uh, use their knowledge of radar and what to, to fight back. Uh, and he couldn't take England. But he, there was a chance when he could have taken England and he didn't do it because he, he considered them uh, allies. Right. And he was very pointed so in them. How now, does all this circle back to Japan? Because we were talking well, I'm, about. I'm, get, I'm, getting, yeah. I'm getting here. I'm, I'm getting there. Cool. Uh, yeah, Jen. Um, Japan, I mean, not Japan. Uh, the, the, so the royal family, if they were invaded by the Germans, they were going to have to escape. Where would they escape to? Canada. Canada's ah. bigger than the United States. Mm -hmm. And this was their place. So he was saying, I'm taking over Canada. You're not going to go to Canada. You're screwed. But what he did was he made a deal with them. And he had, he had an original a war plan that went down to the, the greatest detail. And he says, okay, if you give me the opium trade, in Asia, you can have Canada. Mm. You can be our friend. And wow. actually, uh, England put Churchill in charge because he was married to an American. Mm. And, and that would smooth the connection between the two countries. Right. England wanted to be friends with the United States. Uh, and, and they actually had had quite an alliance as World War II developed. But so anyway, Roosevelt had his own private uh, drug trade here. This was not the U.S. government. This was quasi-government at best. Now, how Japan gets it's involved. so weird because we just always think of Roosevelt as this great guy. You know, he preserved national yeah, parks well, that's and... That, and there's even worse stuff about him. There's even worse stuff, which we don't, it's very occult. Uh, and it, it's, it's a very negative, but he did call Camp David. Uh, he created Camp David, but it was called Shangri-La oh. after the movie about the Tibetan Shambhala. Right. And he, uh, he sent an expedition into, uh, into Asia, you know, uh, that's a whole other story. Nicholas Rorick and his vice president, Henry Wallace. Right. Uh, his vice president, his vice president, Henry Wallace, created Monsanto. His family is Monsanto. And his grandchild got very upset at Douglas for exposing. Uh, he got he, he was actually going ballistic on Douglas for uh, exposing wow. his grandfather. And so is it Roosevelt's family who started Monsanto or? No, Wallace. Wallace. OK. Wallace mm. was a was a Freemason and a occultist who studied under Nicholas Rorick, uh, a Russian. I remember Nicholas who, Rorick. I actually wrote about him yeah, in one did, of my books. Who did, who, he did expeditions mm -hmm. into Asia. Right. Uh, and his alliance with Roosevelt and Wallace was quite sinister. But uh, this takes us off the topic. It's very interesting and will be future of another book, yes. perhaps another broadcast. Yes. But, uh, <laughs> yes, but we get back to um, the problem with Japan. Now, when the United States took over the drug trade, uh, Japan did not want the drug trade in China because they were trying to have economic relations with China. Okay, they want economic relations with China and drugs were not good. The Chinese didn't like the drugs. The Japanese didn't like the drugs. The British had required every citizen to buy a stipend of opium per day or per week, whatever it was, a month. Whoa. This, fund, this funded the, the British Empire. Wow. This is how sinister the British are. But in any case, the Japanese were the good guys to the Chinese. Now, there, there's a lot of hostility between those two countries uh, extant today and and even previous to that, but they were having major peace negotiations and economic relations. The Japanese to this day have provided all of the, they boomed China. They boomed China with technology. 
Uh, China wouldn't be doing what it's doing today without Japan. And the reason they did that is directly related to the Roswell incident and, and Douglas Dietrich, mm. which is Tell us. part of the story. Well, when Douglas, uh, basic, there was a, a, a flap in a UFO museum being created in Japan. And, and Douglas had, had sent them part of the Roswell crash that he retrieved from the archives, you know, a big, a big, you know, Art Bell was promoting all this and they were going to show this. And it, basically uh, they found out it was tested and the metal was, uh, and what was it? It was just, it was aluminum. It was, and it was the aluminum they used, the Japanese had used in balloons, which had crashed in Roswell. But what happened is the United States wanted the property back, and there was a there was a skirmish between the United States and Japan, and Clinton put the kibosh uh, on this, and Japan got revenge. Instead of uh, sharing their technology with the United States, they gave it to China, and this this is what caused the collapse in the you know in the post Clinton era of you know when Al Gore was supposed to be president, it, it just collapsed the economy. We had a big crash. Uh, the United States and Japan caused that directly wow. uh, over this incident. And Douglas is Dietrich. He's very powerful. Um, he's rather impoverished as a mm -hmm. person because he had, and his personal wealth and assets were stripped from him uh, in conjunction with his having to take care of his parents and all he had to go through. But um, so, so anyway, that's why I encourage people to support him because whatever we do with the books is, is peanuts as far as supporting him. But um, in any case, to get back to Japan was trying to limit this trade. So the way you would bring the, the dope up the river was up the rivers because China is so hilly, you can't just go on a highway. It's like super hilly. So you'd have to go up the rivers and you will see the river story of China in the movie, The Sand Pebbles. Mm. And Douglas Dietrich's father was on one of those American gun patrol boats as early as the 1930s. Wow. And Douglas's father saw all this transpire uh, from the 30s. And so, so anyway, you had um, this trade. Now, it wasn't... Uh, so when the J Japanese started stopping the drug trade on the river, which was pretty easy to do, the Americans... FDR created what was known, became known as the Flying Tigers or Air America. This was a secret air force. Wow. And it began the drug trade. And there are some very so the sinister drug, Where characters. was the drug trade coming from? Like, where was the opium coming from? Like, I know heroin today comes from Afghanistan. That's part of the whole Afghanistan war story. But well, they had the Dutch uh, West India Company, uh -huh. and they had the the, the uh, or Dutch East Company, kind of West Company, and, and the East India Company, and basically they they grew the uh, the poppies. I think in India, they uh -huh. grew them in different places, right? Maybe and then even the Caribbean. The China and Japan were kind of like the Silk Road, right? They were like the the route that had to be taken to get them to America, or no, no. they they imported them by ship. Okay, not not the Silk Road, but the which went overland. No, right. they they brought them in through Southeast Asia, and. It's called the Golden Triangle. You can study the Golden Triangle okay. and see about the, the drug trade. Uh, and this goes back into the days of, uh, of of the ships, you know, before more modern times. So anyway, they there was a um, um, lot. I, I had mentioned Laughlin Curry to you privately. Laughlin Curry was FDR's economist. He was right. graduated from Harvard. He was a Canadian. And during the Roosevelt administration, he was exposed as a spy by the FBI working for Stalin. He would write to Stalin and say, you know, I, I have FDR in my back pocket or words to that effect. Um, so when Laughlin Curry was just completely pro-communist, as was FDR, 
I mean, they know him as a socialist, but he was also a communist. He loved Joe Stalin, Joseph Stalin, mm -hmm. he even referred to him as Uncle Joe. Wow. Uh, so Laughlin Curry was exposed as a communist spy, it was in the papers and all this. And so instead of hanging him for treason or prosecuting him, FDR protected him and sent him on a personal mission to China to aid and organize Mao Zedong's communists. Wow. Okay. But um, before Curry came to China, uh, the Chinese were looking at the Japanese as heroes because they were, uh, they were controlling piracy in the Chinese river system. Now, but the, the reason the Japanese did that was to stop the drug trade. And Laughlin Curry was sent in to change that. Wow. And he, uh, what he did was he got a man named Evans Fordus Carlson, a card carrying communist who was a Marine Corps general. He was a Marine Corps general. And it was also Claire Lee Chennault, the founder of the Flying Tigers. And these men were working for him. And although they, they were uh, military men, they were not operating in a military reference frame. They were using right. military weapons, and stuff, but they were using, and, and basically what they did. They were using the military to accomplish private ends, right? Exactly. Clearly, Chenault, the, the founder of the Flying Tigers was medically retired uh, by reason of insanity by the U.S. Army. Uh, he then went to work for the government in China and as a civilian mercenary because he had a lot of knowledge of planes and whatnot. And he was a close ally of Chiang Kai-shek, particularly Chiang Kai-shek's wife, Madam Chiang Kai-shek. And so he began in 1937 to establish the American coordination of the Asian narcotics trade through a company called CNAC, the China National Aviation Corporation. It was an opium airlift operation using Douglas DC-3s and DC-4s. Wow. So Japanese began to shoot this down, shoot those planes down. And so while the Evans Ford is Carlson, uh, is comes into the play when the Japanese are having major peace talks with the Chinese. Uh, so Carlson has his American Marines dressed as Chinese guerrillas in black coolie uniforms. And as Americans dressed as Chinese coolies instigated a hostile military attack at the peace negotiation. Just like what's is, going on today. <laughs> well, yes. And so the Japanese were horrified they thought the Chinese were attacking them. So what did the Japanese do? They were very angry. It became one of the most bloodiest uh, incidents in, in the 1930s. It was called the Rape of Nanjing, wow. which was then the capital of China. And, and the Japanese invasion resulted in hundreds of thousands of deaths because wow. they, they, they were not only felt betrayed by the Chinese, they were sending a Chinese a message. But this was but initiated after, by these American communists. By the Americans, yeah. Yeah, they, they, yeah, yeah. And, and it was only after interrogating their Chinese prisoners that they realized it was not the Chinese who were attacking them in the first place. They were Caucasians. But they didn't know if they, they were Caucasians because they didn't know if they were British or Americans. So the Japanese retaliated by bombing the American ship Penay, P-A-N-A-Y, and Her Majesty's ship, the Lady Bird, in December of 1937. This is all in the papers. And this was the actual beginning of World War II in the Pacific Theater, 1937. It was recognized as a war by the press. It wasn't officially declared. Uh, and if the Americans had declared war, it would be incredibly embarrassing in light of what they did. It would all come out. So they just ignored and they, they continued to fight. So when people would come home uh, or or people would come home from this area, people would say, how's the war going? How's the war going in Asia? It was known as a war. 
Douglas's father knew it as a war. This was all pre-Pearl Harbor. And so there is a whole timeline of events, which is delineated in the book, which shows up to the Pearl Harbor bombing, what was going on. And the United States had restricted oil. They were going to cut Japan off economically. They were cutting them off economically. The final straw would be, you know, maybe a year down the road. But they, they, they cut off uh, Japan's nuts, literally. Uh, wow. economically they, they were gonna they were they were gonna uh have no oil and starve or do worse and of course why did they want the japanese to starve to make them bend the knee and knuckle under this was uh, a war now uh so this is what how the japanese are involved with this drug trade they're undermining the americans drug trade and it's it's uh pissing the americans off to say uh the least. And of course, there's much more detail. But Emperor Hirohito was all ready for this. When he was a young boy, he was trained by a mentor, General Nogi, who was a shogun in the traditional sense. And Emperor Hirohito's father selected him, not the rest of his siblings, but selected him to be trained by General Nogi and part of this training would involve harsh discipline and beatings to make him a, a warrior because he needed a warrior. Now, so Emperor Hirohito was trained as a warrior. And the reason he had this general do it is that he couldn't bear to train him himself this way. It was, it was his son. But he knew his, his son needed to be trained as a warrior. So with this warrior mindset, Emperor Hirohito read a book by Jack London, the heralded American journalist who had served uh, as a reporter in the Russo-Japanese War uh, of the early 1900s, which, um, and he developed a hatred for Asians, Jack London. And they had imprisoned him, he was over there. But Jack London wrote a book called The Unparalleled Invasion. It was a no novella, it was a novella. And he recommended and detailed uh, a agenda for exterminating, exterminating the entire yellow race uh, with biological weapons. We want to exterminate the entirety of the yellow race. Now, the yellow race initially referred to Chinese as opposed to Japanese, but Hirohito read this article because it was translated in Japanese. He also understood English. And he was horrified by what he read of this American mentality. Now, America had already won World War I with biological weapons. There's a whole chapter on that. And yes, H1, H1N1. Uh, they, and, and this was swine flu or bird flu. Uh, they, they, all, all flus come from birds and swine because of the droppings of the birds and the, and the swine. And, and, and these were all domestic. Swine were domestic in China and Asia. Well, yeah, yeah, obviously. And so uh, there had been a whole history of what they called variolation in uh, going back to Washington, where he saved his troops. Uh, at Valley Forge with smallpox. Uh, and he learned this from a slave. He learned this from a slave, a black slave, who knew about variolation is what they called it. They didn't call it vaccination. They called it variolation. And it actually saved Washington's troops. But they also understood that this could be used for biological warfare and they would infect blankets for, you know, to get rid of the Native Americans and whatnot. And so it was warfare. Now, uh, the Surgeon General and another general came to Wilson and said he wanted to get involved in World War I. He wanted to get involved in World War I, which was not going well for the English and the French. The Germans had them. But what, wrote, what uh, Woodrow Wilson cultivated under uh, the Surgeon General, a, um, 
a virus that would kill. And this became known as the Spanish flu. It's really the American Army Navy flu. And they had taken prisoners, infected the prisoners with uh, pigs or chickens, chickens it was. And they put them on a train to go to Leavenworth and some other places. And they all these prisoners who were turned into soldiers were infected with the flu. This is all historical, although they don't give the context. The flu, uh, they, these guys were landed in Spain and they were called, it was called a coffin ship because all of these men were coming in, on, aboard or coming to a shore dead. Some of them survived. They ended up in the trenches of World War I, where it spread not only to the Allies, but to the enemy. And there were so many people killed, it was understated. So many millions of people that this was something the Germans could not fight against. And this is what ended World War I. It was not a military victory in, in any sense. It was biological warfare. Now, the, the Japanese knew this. The Japanese knew what the Americans were capable of. Hirohito says, he says, he says to his uh, mentor, he says, you know, your, your samurai swords and all these things will not win. This is, this, is, uh, this is the war of the future. And the general was horrified by what he saw that he thought that his, uh, his pupil was crazy because he, he was willing to fight with biological weapons. And yeah, the emperor, the baby emperor, he was, he was a young man then, he wasn't fully emperor yet, but he knew what he was gonna have to do. So see, Hirohito is portrayed uh, by the Office of War Information as a kindly old benefactor who, who was fooled by his generals and by his politicians about the war. He was brought into it, but he was really a kindly man. And this is not the case at all. He was a warrior and he was 10 steps ahead. He also capitalized on the failed dirigible technology of the Germans and the Americans who had extensive dirigible technology, but he also undermined it because when America had invaded the Philippines, they wiped out some at least 3 million Muslims, just killed them, genocided, 3 million Muslims. This is why Muslims hate America with good reason. So they were and, and so what the, the Navy did, they took these Filipinos into the Navy and they enslaved them. They, they brought them to America. They didn't have citizenship. They were slaves of the Navy. So it was easy for the, the Japanese to encourage, I don't even think they needed to bribe them, but to facilitate the explosion of these ships. So the American dirigible program kept getting undermined by explosions that were not mistakes. They were sabotage by the Filipino stewards aboard them who could, who could put bombs in the right places. So this is, so, but Hirohito developed dirigible technology because, and then at the same time, he had uh, gotten the yellow fever virus. He had a spy in America who got uh, the yellow fever virus or not. Yeah, and, and basically he ratcheted it up, had to ratchet it back down so he could infect the whole world. If he, if he could deliver the virus to people. So he had a whole unit, he called Unit 731. There was books written about it, which was all dedicated to biological warfare. In fact, the symbol of the sacred crane, he was known as the Shoah Emperor, which meant the sacred crane. And he had a symbol uh, for the sacred crane task force, which was Unit 731. And this is the symbol with a little bit of alteration, not much, that is now used for toxin hazards. It's mm. the same symbol, it's the Japanese symbol. Uh, yes, uh, it's identifiable as toxic hazards. So Emperor Hirohito you, uh, developed dirigible technology to the point where he could take, uh, what do you call it, uh, bombs, what do you make vases out of, uh, porcelain bombs that could drop, you know, the exact time of day to drop them and drop them into hilly areas of China where it would infect the local population. But as Chinese did not travel more than 10 miles outside of their reference zone because of the hills and the geography, it was could be localized and 
and categorized. So he used this in warfare against the Chinese very successfully. Mm. Americans knew this. The Americans knew it because they were in those rivers. So they knew what was going on. Uh, he also developed mini tanks, which we have a picture of in the, in the book. Uh, and he needed little people to operate these dirigibles because it required tiny people. And most Japanese at that time were five feet and under. Uh, a Japanese being five foot six would be very tall. And they also had smaller Japanese and they had the Yakuza class, which was the criminal class, which as part of their atonement, they would sever their pinky finger, sometimes both pinky fingers. So you had three fingered little Japanese guys. When they got in the dirigibles, oh. when they got in the dirigibles, they would shave all of their hair, mm. the, their eyebrows included, because they were using hydrogen balloons, not helium balloons. And this was very ignitable. So they don't want to have any hair on their bodies, right. uh, even shave their heads. So you see, they looked like aliens. Right. Uh, they, they were, were tiny little, with three fingers. They had three fingers. They shaved their hair. Shaved yeah. their hair. Wow. So, yeah. So uh, it, it was a, a great uh, excuse to create a myth. But we haven't we haven't gotten to Roswell yet. But <laughs> all of this. Starting to see the glimmers of Roswell. Well, yes. Now, this was China. Now, as war came, and uh, Hirohito was a doctor of marine biology. He studied marine biology because he he knew when he was young after reading this story by Jack London that he had to protect his empire with biological warfare. So he became a PhD in marine biology, wow. uh, a fact which is, is historically accurate but very understated. And this is where his knowledge of germ warfare came from. Mm. Uh, he was famous as a marine biologist for discovering a species. And... But as you say, it's all understated. So he was, uh, he also uh, was a man of incredible wealth. And when part of the story is when he, before he, uh, well, when he first uh, invaded the rest of Asia, he took all of their gold. He confiscated the treasuries of all these countries in Asia, from Korea to Thailand to Vietnam, whatever. He went and wow. took all their wealth. Now, aside from that, he had his own person. Aside from that, he had his own personal fortune, and this is not from Douglas Dietrich, but from conventional sources. He had a hundred billion dollars in Swiss banks. A hundred billion dollars, not in today's a hundred billion dollars. In those days, a hundred billion. Wow. He was the richest man in the world, mm -hmm. and and he he could hit his own personal bank account to fund anything he wanted to. Now, this gold comes later in the story when he buries it in about 24 tunnels uh, in and around the Philippines, in the water, he, it's buried. And this, this, this gold, this gold was later used to bribe General MacArthur mm. into doing anything. Uh, General MacArthur being the uh, resident American supposedly in charge of Japan. He was really, he was called the, the, the Japanese, the emperor's general because he did everything the general wanted. The Americans called him the emperor's general because he did everything the emperor wanted him to. Now, uh, and MacArthur had an extensive background in the Asia and in the Philippines. So that's why he selected MacArthur. But in any case, we're, we're getting ahead of ourselves. As a marine biologist, Hirohito studied what was called the Kuroshio current, sometimes called the Japanese current. This is an air current that runs up the coast of Japan, across underneath the Aleutian Islands, and down the coast of America. Now, you can put up a dirigible and get to America in three days if you know the currents. And this, so we have uh, the Pearl Harbor attack in 1941, December. It wipes out. But it really wasn't what everybody thought. Those ships that were bombed in Pearl Harbor, the Americans knew it was coming. They were retired World War I ships. One of them was made to look like an aircraft carrier, but it wasn't. The Americans were actually 
having the Japanese sink the ships for them. They were wow. of no longer any use. So it was, there was so much trickery and chicanery that went on. Uh, but in any case, the Americans had had their toast handed to them in Pearl Harbor, December. In, January, in February 24th, 25th, February. This is only two and a half months, six or seven weeks after Pearl Harbor. These huge dirigibles appear over the city of Los Angeles. First, submarines shell the Santa Barbara coast. That makes the newspapers in California. Then these dirigibles appear, and this is known as the Battle of Los Angeles. And the Japanese are scaring the daylights out of the American generals and the population. This is in papers, Long Beach papers, Long Beach, California, uh, where I grew up, Los Angeles, California, the papers, battle of, you know, air attack. These, these papers are in the book. And about what year and is this, Peter? This 1942, 42. February, 1942. Okay. You know, two and a half months after Pearl Harbor, within three months of Pearl Harbor. And, and the Americans panic. They know the emperor has, and these things have planes attached to them. So the planes are flying over Los Angeles and the Americans are shooting at them. And then, um, but the Americans know that the Japanese have bio-warfare weapons and they're afraid that the city of Los Angeles is being biologically attacked, right. but they're not. Hirohito never wanted war with the Americans. Never. He wanted economic trade. He wanted to be part of the economy. And the Americans were controlling and that they were trying to capture Japan. He didn't want to kill the Americans. It's going to hurt his trade prospects. So he uh, just scared them. Now, what they did is they panicked. They started, they created a yellow fever vaccine. They knew he had yellow fever. So they created a vaccine. Boom, boom, boom. A vaccine normally takes a minimum of 10 years before it can be declared workable by you know, the medical field. This vaccine was not approved by anybody, not by the FDA. It was rushed. It killed 50,000 of their own troops and disabled eventually 350,000 more. Wow. It was the biggest embarrassment of the U.S. Army. Sounds like a familiar the, story. <laughs> the U.S. Secretary of the U.S. Navy sought to calm the public, and he says, you know, if there were no such attacks, he says, this is a case of war nerves. In other words, people had war nerves, so they, they started hallucinating and seeing things in the air that weren't there. But there were definitely things in the air. Uh, this is, you know, well documented in the book, and it's documented by independent investigation. Now, Hollywood has since come forward with a movie called The Battle of L.A., oh, and, wow. and, and it's all been fictionalized. Hollywood is an arm of, was always an arm of the, the Department of, uh, of War Information, right. the Office of War Information. Right. So Hollywood, and you even have Jimmy Stewart and all of the studios being part of the military. They were even even Marilyn Monroe had a card representing herself in the military because Hollywood was co-opted by the military and they had a place called First Motion Picture Unit that is uh, was bought by uh, I think his name is Jay Leto, uh, a modern day rock star. Uh, but it, it was it was only revealed in like 1991 that that Hollywood had a hidden motion picture studio. That was for the U.S. Army. Interesting. So, yeah, they were completely co-opted, and so you have all these alien movies coming out in the 1950s, early 1950s. So it was 48 are, when Roswell happened, right, or 47? 47. So this is 47. Three years after this L.A. Um, so what happened? Roswell five years five years after Roswell. So yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what happened in between. Okay. So anyway, you have Roswell. So you have two major battles in which the Americans are completely humiliated. And the Americans humiliate themselves in the Battle of L.A. Uh -huh. The Japanese don't really do anything. And they achieved a major victory by just 
showing their their ships. But the Americans, uh, and and this has gone into the. Uh, they wanted to kill every last Japanese. Japanese is a language that only be spoken in hell. They want to eliminate. They're making Jack London's story come true. They want to kill every last Japanese. Right. Just uh, one of these days, I'd like to do a show with you on just the awfulness of this war machine, you know, and what the satanic energies are behind it and what has been running it in this world. But let's not go down that track right now. Well, it, 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 it goes very deep, but this yes. is the... And this is what we've all been living with. The Americans are heroes. The Americans are heroes. They beat the Japanese. So then uh, what happens is the tide turns. If you listen to the Office of War Information in the Battle of Midway, the Battle of Midway was a complete falsehood. Hirohito lured the Americans to attack Midway and was willing to sacrifice his carriers because the carriers were of no military use. They had very limited military use. Instead, he wanted the Aleutian Islands. He wanted, and he invaded the Aleutian Islands successfully because the Aleutian Islands were a place you could bomb Japan from very easily. So when he took the Aleutian Islands, the Americans had to go all the way down into the South Pacific and and go upwards and and they do all this island hopping to get a base where they could fight the Japanese. And the Jap, and because they they had a, a great problem when they didn't know what the Kuroshio current was. So when they would fly crap, they would hit against the wind and they, they were befuddled. Mm. This is the later day evolution of the Heart Project. One of the one of the primary purposes oh. of the Heart Project in Alaska was to make these winds die down in the case to either stop the Japan Japan from Japan from coming over or the Americans to facilitate bombing. Oh, yeah, it yeah. all pulled together. Douglas wow. studied heart. He is assigned to go study harp uh, as one of his uh, duties. He was said to be a spy, uh, to be a spy at uh, Sonoma State University, where they were uh, doing conferences on harp and whatnot. But um, and, and there's other esoteric purposes besides uh, that with harp. However, you have the uh, okay. So Midway is a apparent success for the Americans, but it's really not. And the Americans were having horrible losses. We will fast forward through the book to get to the more sensational aspects of what's offered. But when we get to World War, the end of World War II, we have this policy of FDR saying, unconditional surrender, unconditional surrender. And they make the Potsdam Declaration. And meanwhile, Hirohito has been asking for peace. It's documented since January of 1945. He does not want war. And the Americans are the aggressors, and they won't listen to him. And this is really fascinating history, too. And I don't know, like you said, if the younger people will even, you know, get it at that level. But somebody like me, like, I remember my dad's stories of World War II, of DC-3s, of the dirigibles, and now I'm seeing glimmerings of things he talked about that, you know, we didn't really know what they meant then, but now they're making sense. Well, yes, and and there's another aspect to what Hirohito was doing. He was releasing Fugo balloon bombs on the Kuroshio Current to America, starting firestorms. And were some of those seen as UFOs or reported as UFOs? No, they knew what they were. They were bombs from the Japanese. They they were recognized as as fire balloon balloon bombs. And they, see, what Hirohito was doing is he was sending these, creating massive fires, massive fires in the Northwest. And what he was doing, he was sending planes off of submarines to map these air currents of the fires. The fires were to study the air currents. Wow. Not to destroy the United States. It was a terror tactic, but it was mapping the air currents so that if he wanted to bomb the United States with these dirigibles, he knew the air currents to manipulate the dirigibles. Amazing. So he he figured out uh, by the end of the war how to completely annihilate the United States biologically. And so 
when we we get into 1945, um, when FDR died, it was a great relief for Hitler because FDR was propagating the war. That's why Hitler was so exuberant on Hitler's death. He thought it was going to change things. And it really did. Uh, so Truman was left over to clean up the mess. And basically what had happened, Germany had been defeated in the field, not in its inner core, uh, not what will become you know, the Fourth Reich so-called, but, but, the, but the German territory was lost but the Japanese were very far from being, see, the whole Japanese war machine was in the Asian mainland. It was not in Japan, all their troops. So when they bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it did nothing to the war machine whatsoever, it did nothing. And so, but, but when the first bomb dropped on Hiroshima, Emperor Hirohito immediately sent three of these super dirigibles and there's pictures of them they're they're illustrations because douglas could not successfully steal them he he made sketches in his mind and he's a he's a graphic illustrator right and they were and so they're beautiful illustrations mm. of what they actually were but these three super dirigibles flown along the crucial current it took three days one of them got misdirected and crashed near Aztec, New Mexico. That's called, that's been a whole UFO crash. It's not a UFO. It's been turned into a big shenanigan. Oh, this is the, there was a crash in 1945 before Roswell. Ah. We know the aliens are here. It's stupid. Two of them landed at Area 51. They were equipped with biological weapons that they sent to Fort Dietrich in Maryland, spelled differently than Douglas Dietrich, not the same name same pronunciation. And they saw that these were enough uh, poison to not just kill the United States, but the entire world. So they then agreed. He had already accepted the Potsdam Declaration, Hirohito, with one exception. He says that this shall in no way compromise the rulership of Japan by the emperor. So in other words, yeah. We'll accept your terms, but I'm still in charge. Right. Which basically said, I'm in charge. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, yeah, I'm, I won, you won, but you didn't win. Right. I'm in charge. So basically they wouldn't accept it. They finally assented, accepted his terms and they accepted it on August 15th, which is a very monumental day in Japanese history. Wow. It is, it is. Uh, this uh, August 15th is the anniversary when an ancient emperor who I cannot name because I don't have it in front of me um, was being invaded by Kublai Khan and the Chinese for the second time and they had already Kublai Khan's force had already been wiped out by typhoons well he, they were going to come back in bigger hordes and wipe out the entire island of Japan and take it as a colony and, and the Japanese had no defense. So the emperor prayed to the gods, the great god and the kamikaze winds, the kamikaze of the winds, they came and wiped away the, Jap the Chinese. Kublai Khan never came back. Very cool. They were defeated. Yeah, so that was a sacred day where the emperor had intervened. And it was on that day that the Japanese, the Americans accepted the terms of Hirohito. Now, he let the Americans say face with the Missouri ceremony, but he insisted that a flag, a particular flag be sent out and used on the Missouri. This was the same flag that Commodore Perry had brought to Tokyo Harbor, but it was not an American flag. It was an upside down American flag with not the same, with, with irregular stars. It looked like an American flag upside down, but it was not. Hmm. And then it was, um, on the other side, it was a white flag. 
was white, but they don't show that on the Missouri. But you'll see it on the bulkhead of the Missouri. We have pictures. It is it is not a legal flag. It is not an American flag. It never was an American flag. It looked like an American flag. And the reason for that is when Commodore Perry went to invade Japan, he was not doing it under authorized or legal orders of the U.S. government. He was doing it on behalf of the government. They said, if you get caught, if somebody comes in and attacks you, you raise this flag because it's a white flag on one side, which means surrender. The other flag shows that you're really, it's not truly, you're, you look like you're flying under the American flag, but you're really not. So this is not an American invasion. This is the Commodore Perry invasion. And then he, they, you know, so, so he did not get caught. So this was exposed, not, he was not exposed, but this is the flag that Emperor Hirohito insisted. And it was like flown at rapid pace to get there in time for the ceremony. Wow. There's a whole story about that. And so you had uh, a bogus ceremony, which with no Hirohito there and with no surrender of samurai swords or anything, it was not an official ceremony, but the Americans were allowed to save face. Now, You'll also find that President Harry Truman can be seen on YouTube as declaring on December 31st, 1946, the end of hostilities of World War II, the mm. end of hostility. Well, the Nuremberg hangings had taken place by then. Mm -hmm. So there were no hostilities in Germany uh, on the European continent to speak of. Hostilities were still going on in Japan, but it was an uneasy it was a, there was a truce, but there was it was still hostilities didn't end until 1946. The Roswell incident happens as a result of these dirigibles having landed and the Americans now wanting to use them for their own purpose. They wanted to go clean up Antarctica because they sent Admiral Byrd down there in 1946. And Admiral Byrd was sent with a team of military people and they were defeated by the uh, by the Germans who were down in Antarctica. They could not take the Germans. They had mm. advanced flight craft and whatnot. And they, uh, the Japanese had also given the Germans radar, which they were able to uh, detect all of the Americans and whatnot. So they were outclassed by the Axis powers. The, the, the Americans now thought they could take these dirigibles and fly them down to Antarctica and beat the Germans, which is a stupid idea. Nevertheless, they were trying. So they were taking these tiny Yakuza's and trying, forcing them, torturing them to operate these things. Mm. Now, some of these planes that were aboard, and they're shown how they all hooked up like peaking ducks. and could, These dirigibles were like three football fields Large. Wow. 300 yards. Wow. Huge. Three football fields. I mean, if you were looking at the Super Bowl, they'd be taking over the whole Super Bowl. Right. You know, not, you know. Uh, so what the Americans did was they, what, what some of these Japanese escaped in what was called these, these planes, which were developed by the Japanese from what was called the, I think it was the Horton Flying Wing. I get the name in the book. They escape and they're flying over the state of Washington. And they are witnessed by an American pilot named Kenneth Arnold. He sees them and he reports them as flying saucers. Mm. They're not flying saucers. They're airplanes that are moving very fast and something he's never seen before. And then the army goes in and, you know, makes him show that these are, this is what he saw. He's holding up a picture of what he saw. They influenced him, but he didn't see flying. But this is where the term flying saucer comes from. Cute. He's Japanese escaping over the state of Washington and Kenneth Arnold. This is just a couple of weeks before the Roswell incident, by the way. Right. Japanese are, some Japanese are escaping and then some Japanese are taking a mission and they're around the four corners because they landed in, in Nevada, Area 51, Tanapa Army Airfield, which is now known as Area 51. That's where this happened. Because Hirohito knew where the most advanced craft of America was, he, and he was sending them a message. I can come to your doorstep. 
And anyway, he had um, these these Japanese were in the dirigible. The Americans could not get inside, and they basically self-immolated. They sabotaged themselves. The balloon had drifted over Roswell, and they crashed. Some survived, some didn't, and and then this story gets resurrected years later, and the whole city of Roswell has lost its Air Force base. They have no economy. And Colonel Michael Aquino basically cuts them a deal and gives them a UFO museum and a whole industry. Mm. And this, this is covered in the book. It's covered in the Roswell Museum. And there's so many more details in the book. Right. We kind of need to bring this to a close, but it's an That's, amazing. We're right in the perfect time for that. Yes. Fascinating story. Very fascinating. And, um, I, really, really good. I can't wait to read it. One question: Is it available as an ebook or just as a hard copy yes. book? Yes, it's available. It's available an ebook at Kindle. Okay. Kindle on Amazon. Amazon.com. Okay. You can get it as an ebook. Okay. Um, you can uh, buy it at Amazon. You can buy it at SkybooksUSA.com. It's still on Great. sale at SkybooksUSA.com. Amazon might give you a better deal. I don't know. I don't care. Just buy the book. Yeah. And and it's more important than, than buying the book is, is that you spread the word on the book because this is being counter maneuvered. I have published many books and I have never seen a book come to such an abrupt halt as this one. We got off to a good start by books that we sold at Sky Books by our distributor. And then all of a sudden, it's like it stopped. It's almost as like people are being ordered verbally or psychically not to buy this book. Mm -hmm. And this is disclosure. Right. Everybody was pushing disclosure. The New Age community, the UFO community, the Fox News community, it's disclosure. It's disclosure. Here is your disclosure. Uh, but, you know, what is that line that, that, that Billy Crystal used to like to make fun of from uh, where's your Moses now? Where's your Moses now from the Ten Commandments? Well, where's your disclosure now? Here's your disclosure. You don't want your disclosure. Here's your, eat your disclosure. Right. Uh, so people don't want disclosure because it's too ontologically shocking. Right. Well, once you get this book and get over the ontological shock, we have more to go into, into the uh, satanic infrastructure of what's happened in our world. It's kind of like going into the land of Mordor. From I'd the Lord love of the to Ring. do a show with you on that, Peter. I know you'll have books coming up on it, um, but whatever we can do. Um, thank you so much for being here today. This is really, really cool. I'm going to do my best to get it out, and we invite people to share this. If you listen to it and find it interesting, um, and I know that you'll share it as well, we'll put some good links under the video in the description, where to get the books, um, how to access Douglas Dietrich's YouTube and um, the video you and I did before on that had Rudolf Hess as kind of the center of it, Spandau mystery. And right. um, we'll do more of this because I think this is just important, so important to be getting out right now. That would be great. It's always great to be with you, Carrie. Yeah. Thank you so much. I want to remind everybody to breathe smile and love because by do so doing we change our own neurobiology and by doing thus we change the world i'm gonna play our um our outro song and then if you want to just hang out a minute peter we can chat after this is over okay sure we'll see to. you soon and if you're feeling kind of down and you need some inspiration to remember who you are And these words can take you far I am a 21st century superhuman And I know that the answers are inside I am a 21st century superhuman Now, now, now is the time